There we go, Chair. OK, thank you. Yeah, welcome all to the planning committee. And um, first item on our agenda is any apologies for absence? From Councillor Taylor Lloyd, Chair. There is one, yeah, OK. Uh, item two, discloses of personal and prejudicial interests. Yes, Chair. Um, I have a prejudicial interest in declaring item three on the schedule, and I will leave the meeting for that item. Uh, Please don't, um, don't forget to invite me back in, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Sorry about that. Yeah. And uh, likewise, uh, I'll be declaring an interest in the same item, and I would assume all other members would, being as we know the applicant. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. I've certainly yeah. done an interest sheet, so. Yeah, it's all been, the sheet has been sent around just minutes ago. And um, item three then, <laughs> to approve and sign the minutes of the previous meeting as a correct record. You'll find that on page one, two, three. So we'll go to page one, page two, and page three. Somebody move is a true record, please. Yeah, move, Chair. Thank you. Appreciate that. And then item four uh, is the determination of planning applications under the Town and Country Planning Act of 1990. And the first one you find that item one is of page seven, and that's at Cogley de Cairo. Andrew. Thank you, Chair. Um, so Ian's going to do a presentation on this one. Uh, thanks, Ian. Um, so this is an application for phases three and four um, of the development at uh, Cymru de Cairo Quarry. If you can go to the site location plan, please, Ian. Uh, I'd just like to refer members to the update sheet, uh, which notes the key changes since the introduction of the placemaking uh, supplementary planning guidance on the 22nd of October. Uh, so if members do have any questions, then by all means, please, please ask away. Um, at, at the end of the presentation. So we've got the site location plan. The application is being reported to committee as the outline application was submitted with an environmental statement and the development also exceeds the committee threshold. So outline planning permission was granted on appeal by the Welsh ministers in January 2018 for the cessation of the landfill uh, and the residential development of a site for circa 300 dwellings. So that's the land shown in blue. Um, the current site comprises phases three and four, as identified in red, either side of the quarry basin. Uh, phase one has been developed and comprised 28 dwellings, and phase two uh, comprises 121 dwellings. So 149 dwellings have been uh, approved to date. Uh, and this application seeks permission for 73 dwellings in phase three and 36 dwellings in phase four. Uh, it's also worth noting that uh, a separate application is in for the landscaping reserve matter for these phases, uh, which would need to be reported to planning committee in the future. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please, Ian. So this is a Google map view of the outline site, which comprises predominantly the dark green area located in the middle of the screen, which was a former quarry and extends up to housing in the north and east. But the application site is in the vicinity of the area of the hard standing adjacent to the quarry road. Uh, so this is either side of the quarry basin effectively. Um, and it must be clarified that this isn't a recent photo as the development has commenced on various parts of the site. Uh, including behind Bradorian Drive and from My Sigourney Road. Uh, and Maris Morrison Golf Club adjoins the site to the south. Uh, if you could go to the next plan, please, Ian. This is just an indicative master plan of the site. So this was submitted with the outline application. Um, and what you'll see is, as I said, uh, when you look at these phases, you'll just look at what this shows. But you'll note on the eastern side, the previously submitted master plan uh, proposed properties backing onto uh, Cymru to Cairo Road uh, and fronting onto the quarry basin in phase three with a row of housing and Spine Street in between. Uh, and phase four is a similar setup with properties backing onto the golf course, uh, a Spine Street and properties fronting onto the quarry basin. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please, Ian. Thank you. This is the phase three layout plan. Um, the slide shows the layout as proposed. Uh, what you'll note is the eastern properties front onto the Spine Street as indicated on the master plan with the properties backing onto the properties on Kermi de Cairo Road. 
There's an active frontage overlooking the quarry basin and the active travel route around to the edge of the basin with an informal layout in between comprising of private drives and an east-west uh, green walkway through the site. Um, if you note, there's a lot of green infrastructure and streets, uh, and streets trees running along the main spine street uh, and areas of open space in the southwestern and southeastern corners of the site with uh, a category A oak tree retained in the southeast corner. Uh, the open space and spine street are well overlooked throughout. You'll note there on the plan uh, on the main spine street, there's a slight kink on the spine street that's actually caused some problems from a, a local highways perspective in terms of uh, visibility. Uh, so we have put a condition on to require that to be revised in terms of layout uh, and both highways and placemaking are satisfied with that approach. If you could go to slide, slide five, please, Ian. Thank you. Uh, these are proposed street scenes uh, through the site, and I appreciate they're not uh, the biggest given how long the actual sections are. Uh, but section AA is at the top uh, in pink and shows the properties dropping along the spine street from north to south. So these properties have a more modern appearance. Uh, materials include brick, render and weatherboarding, uh, as they have in the previous phase, phase two. You'll note the step nature of the plots. Uh, is apparent along with the introduction of two and a half storey buildings, um, but these were used in the previous phase. The middle section, uh, BB, is the green section showing the frontage overlooking the quarry basin uh, with the green avenue apparent between the second and the third properties. Uh, and section CC, a, the blue uh, line on the plan, is the run through the Green Avenue with the left-hand property fronting onto the basin and the Spine Street located between the third and fourth properties. <clears throat> You'll also note they are, they are obscured by trees, but there, there is good articulation to ensure, to ensure active frontages overlooking um, the public domain on the corner to inner properties. If you could go to slide six, please, Ian. So phase four, is located between Morriston Golf Club and comprises more traditionally designed dwellings uh, and incorporates several bungalows. The properties face onto the main spine street, which curves around at the southern end of the site, uh, and note the pedestrian link which extends to phase three. Uh, so that's shown in the top left hand corner of the plan. Uh, again, the properties run onto the basin with a retaining wall behind these properties uh, and street trees and GI have been incorporated uh, throughout the site. Uh, if we can go to the um, uh, street sections, please, Ian. Thank you. Um, so section BB is at the top. This shows the frontage overlooking the quarry basin. Uh, again, you'll note a more traditional design in terms of these properties uh, and they're predominantly detached along this run. The middle section is um, section AA. This shows the frontage running along the spine street, but looking towards the quarry. Uh, and if you can just go to the next slide, please, Ian. This just gives an indication of the actual levels across the site. So the section at the top is through phase four from the golf club down towards the quarry basin. The dotted blue line are the existing levels and the yellow blocks are the dwellings uh, at the proposed ground levels. So the section is indicated with a red line on the plan at the bottom and the bottom section is through phase three, shows the relationship with neighbouring backland property at number 55 Cymru de Cairo Road, as noted in the report. Uh, but note levels are being reduced here in this part of the site uh, and mitigation measures are incorporated with regards to that individual property. So it's important to note that the existing permission has been commenced and remains extant. So the principle of the use is therefore acceptable uh, and landscaping is considered for future consideration. We've only had one letter of objection slash comment, which was querying a concrete drainage channel that's been retained along the back of number 55 and a query about the height of the new dwelling. So the sections and plans have been provided to that resident. We haven't had any objections from strategic planning and placemaking. Uh, the local highways authority subject to conditions, pollution control, the tree officer, ecology, NRW, uh, Dora Cymru Welsh Water, Network Rail or the police designing that crime officer. Um, as I said, you'll note that the application has been in for uh, quite a while and has been subject to significant amendments during that period. From a placemaking perspective, GI has been introduced throughout the site and is welcomed. Uh, both areas are open space and the circular route are well overlooked. 
uh, the visual impact of the properties is considered acceptable and they're considered to be no significant impact on neighbouring residential amenity as a result of the proposals, notwithstanding the changes introduced as part of the new uh, supplementary planning guidance. The council's ecologists and NRW are satisfied with the proposals following further clarification uh, and the local highways authority has no objections subject to that minor revision I noted on the spine street. So landscaping will be extremely important, will be considered separately and reported to committee at a future date. Uh, the recommendation is for approval subject to conditions. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. I got two of the many. Councillor Des Thomas and Councillor Wild. Uh, Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ian, for the presentation. Um, I note that <coughs> on an omission, perhaps, on most of the plans, there is no north indication, which I think would be useful, and perhaps that could be borne in mind for, for future reference. Um, what I have in mind is, do developers ever think of um, Face, facing their properties south, for instance. Um, we need to squeeze every bit of thermal gain out of sunshine and so on. And a property facing south is far warmer than, a, say, for instance, a property facing north. Can I have a thought on that? Yeah, we'll come back to that then. OK. Councillor White. Yes, thank you, Chair. I've got a couple of points, if I may. Um, one you've already sort of um, uh, sort of mentioned about the, the visibility, which I was going to pick up with traffic, which is now is a condition. In regards to page 32, the tree protection, so you mentioned about the one oak tree and the other trees along the protected trees on the western side of phase four. Um, I know we, we've had issues which we have had problems where developers are not exactly adhere to the rules. Uh, so what assurances have we got that obviously um, that mm -hmm. the, 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 these, this, the, 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 um, the uh, information is going to be um, uh, uh, taken on board by the, by, by, by the developer in regards to the, the oak tree and, and, and the trees on, on the north, which are protected. And thirdly, uh, on the other point, Chair, in regards to drainage, um, says about obviously within the report on page 33 about uh, the the issue of the Cumbri Cairo River uh, stream. Uh, what what measures have we got that we show that the runoff from the site doesn't get into that river? If we could have any um, uh, assurances on that point as well. Th thank you, Chair. Okay, we'll do. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Evans. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I haven't got a comment at the moment. I uh, just apologise, and I was a late booking in because I had difficulty with the connection. I don't know why. So oh. <clears throat> I came into this meeting at 14.06. Yeah. Uh, I, I assume that's been noted. And I've yeah. listened to the uh, officer's rep presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Anderson. Yeah, just going back to uh, what Councillor Thomas asked about uh, building spaces south. I can see what he's trying to get at because uh, facing south, if they wish to put solar panels on, then uh, once they develop, once they've bought. But also, would these buildings have um, like charging facilities for cars? Okay, can't do that. Answer. That's, that's all my question. Yeah. Okay. But bear in mind, members, this is a reserve matters application. Uh, Councillor Mary Jones. Uh, thank you, Chair. Now, I, I heard the magic word render, and <laughs> Councillor Thomas didn't say it. So I know. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, it's render, because I've been somewhere this morning on a, a visit, and I went past the housing um, up in Morva, and the render is covered and all the streaks coming down. I know we've been told that, oh, it's upgraded. Well, I'm sorry, I don't think it is upgraded. So can we please ask uh, these uh, developers to use something else 
to face their buildings. And I agree with the South, uh, properties facing South, but I could, I live in a property facing South and the back of my house is quite cold in the North. So it swings and roundabouts. Plus we all ought to be East and West. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, okay. No other hands up there. Anything you want to respond to there, Andrew, please? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll go through in terms of the order they, they were they were raised. And if I do miss anything, uh, please, by all means, uh, let me know. Yeah, in, in terms of building orientation, obviously, that is something that developers will consider in terms of from, from a sustainability standpoint. Uh, as you'll note, however, there are other constraints on sites that we need to be mindful of. And it's simply not possible to ensure that every property faces south uh, in terms of your traditional uh, site layout. Um, so as I showed on the site location plan, and there was a master plan that was submitted with the original application and the design principles have been followed as far as practicable. So whilst we would encourage it, we can't insist on it when there's other constraints to make sure that we're using land uh, in uh, you know, uh, the most um, uh, rational manner because obviously that land is a finite resource uh, and we don't, you know, we've got other considerations to, uh, to look into when and when a developer is laying out a site. Uh, in terms of visibility, Councillor White, um, as I said, the, the proposals as amended would be subject to further consultation with the local highways authority to make sure they were happy, but in principle, they are satisfied that visibility can be provided to an acceptable manner subject to changes. With regards to tree protection, you'll note on the permission, there are tree protection measures indicated um, for the protected trees on the site. Uh, they are conditions of any permission. As with anything, we can't legislate for people not adhering to uh, you know, the law and guidance. And if something does come up, we will have to consider what recourse the authority has as and when that happens. But we can't just assume it's going to happen. Um, the drainage details have been um, considered. Uh, all surface water from the development will be discharged at an attenuated rate uh, into Cymru de Cairo stream. Um, and both the council's drainage officer and Dwarf Cymru Welsh Water are satisfied with the drainage arrangements. Uh, Councillor Anderson questioned charging facilities for ultra low emission vehicles. Um, from a policy perspective, there's a requirement to ensure that they are included on non-residential developments, but there's no policy requirement to uh, require them for residential developments at the moment, uh, and therefore we can't insist on that. Um, and similarly with render, uh, it is a material that has been used successfully in Swansea. I appreciate there are, there are some more recent examples, but historically it is used uh, across the authority. Um, and, and I tried to head it off for Councillor Thomas this time by stating we would uh, put a condition on with regards to the details in the report. So um, that's what we've done. We, ha we have asked for further details uh, of the render um, and are mindful of obviously members' concerns on that fact. Uh, which will be considered further as and when, uh, if members are minded to approve the application, they look to submit the details to discharge conditions. Thank you, Chair. I think that was everything. Well, thank you very much. Um, yeah, covered well. Uh, I got no other hands up to speak then, uh, but not being, no? okay, not being so then um, you can see the recommendation on page 35 is one of approval. So we'll uh, take a vote on that now. Yep. Yeah. Cyril Anderson. Four. Peter Black. Four. Phil Downing. Four. Will Evans. Four. Mary Jones. Four. Mike Lewis. Four. Richard Lewis. Four, Chairman. Paulette Smith. Four. There's Thomas. Four. Mike White. Four. I'm polite. Yeah, cool. That's Thank you. unanimous. Chair 11, yeah. four, and against. There we are. Yeah, that was good out unanimous. So the second item then is Swansea Bay. You find that uh, on page 42. And it's Andrew again. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, yeah. Ian's going to do a presentation on this one again. Uh, if we can go to the site location plan. Thank you, Ian. Um, so the application, this application, as I said, there are no updates on this application for a car sales dealership and associated works at land to the west of Heron Drive. The application is being reported to planning committee due to the floor area to be created as part of the development. The site is outlined in red. 
located within the Swansea Vale Riverside Business Park and benefits from road frontages to Swansea Vale to the north, which is a dual carriageway, Heron Drive to the east and Moorhen close to the south. On the opposite side of Moorhen close are the former Dornus offices to the south and on the opposite side of Heron Drive is the complex office complex at Axis Court uh, and the River Towey runs along the western side of the site with a shared use pathway in between. Uh, if you can go to Google Maps, please, or the next view. Sorry, thank you. Yeah, this is Google Maps, uh, an overview of the site. Uh, so you'll note that the site has naturally revegetated with scrub, having previously been cleared. But you'll also note that infrastructure has been provided to provide access to the site. Uh, and you've got the A4067 Neath Road dual carriageway, which runs along the opposite side of the, the Towie. If you can go to the next slide, please, Ian. These are just some Google photos. Um, so the top left is a view along the site frontage looking south with the site frontage on the right hand side of the picture and axis court on the left. Um, you'll note there's significant landscaping along the axis court side, um, which is, as I said, a feature of this uh, part of uh, the, the road and street and is something that the authority are looking to ensure that there's adequate landscaping on the opposite side of the road. In the top right is a view of the mature trees along Swansea Vale Road to the north of the site, looking east. Uh, the middle right is the Moorhen Close entrance into the site, so that's the infrastructure I was talking about, which is uh, obviously been laid out to provide access to the site. The bottom right is the western view of the site, with the River Towie and the pedestrian path in the foreground. And the bottom left is a view looking west across the northern boundary with Swansea Vale, just to give you a bit of a, a flavour of the site. If you can go to the next slide, please, Ian. Um, thank you. So this is the proposed site layout. Uh, you'll note that the customer access into the site is from Heron Drive, so that's on the eastern edge of the side. Uh, the site with customer parking uh, indicated in a light red colour. Uh, the main show showroom is located to the west of the customer parking, with the workshop at the rear in orange, and a wash valley and smart repair building to the rear again in the orange. Uh, the blue hatch along the uh, western side of the, the pipe uh, at the site is an existing pipe on site and an easement for that. Um, so yeah, and then you've got an external sales area to the south of the building. Uh, you'll note that there are trees vegetation uh, retained along the northern and western boundaries located both within and outside the site. Uh, and there's a strong landscaping belt along the street wheel, Heron Drive effectively and more Hen Close. If you can go to the next one, please, Ian. These are the proposed elevations. So this is the top elevation would face east onto Heron Drive, which has a high degree of glazing within the building, as you'd expect. Uh, the building's clad in grey uh, and silver. The second elevation is the main showroom, also faces north uh, onto the Swansea Vale dual carriageway, although it would not be prominent from outside of the site due to um, the existing vegetation along that site edge. The third elevation shows the building's southern elevation facing Moorhen Close, so again you've got the, the wraparound glazing um, and then the workshop at the rear, and the bottom elevation just shows the rear elevation facing west. Uh, the next slide shows some proposed visuals. Uh, so the top visual is a view looking from the Swansea Vale south uh, roundabout southwest at the roundabout with Heron Drive. Uh, and the bottom visual is from Swansea Vale looking southeast from the main road into Swansea Vale with the building largely screened by trees due to the natural topography. So just to summarise, no objections have been received to date from any statutory consultees or neighbours. Uh, in terms of the principle of development, the site is located within the Swansea Enterprise Park and is allocated within the local development plan as part of a mixed use strategic site, SDI, Swansea Vale, and is designated as employment land within the concept plan. So whilst the proposed car sales is classified as a, a unique use, i.e. it's not a, a B1, B2 uh, traditional commercial use, it would provide for 35 new jobs and the safeguarding of a further 65 jobs, which is supported in principle. In terms of design, the building itself would face Heron Drive with active elements to the north, albeit it would be screened by vegetation, and significant landscaping has been proposed to screen the parked cars along Moorhen Close and Heron Drive, which is considered acceptable. 
Um, the rear would be well screened and it is difficult to provide, given the nature of the use, an active, meaningful frontage along uh, this side. The trees that, that are on site that are proposed to be removed, the category C, which are low quality or category U and effectively unsuitable for attention, uh, and a revised tree protection plan would be required by and secured by condition. Um, the tree officer has advised that replacement planting is considered suitable uh, and there are no ecology concerns subject to conditions. In terms of the local highways uh, authority assessment, the transport statement indicates there will be 151 daily two-way movements, uh, and it's predicted that most of these vehicle trips will be routing along the A4067. 34 customer parking spaces are provided, incorporating two disabled spaces and two parent-child spaces, and ultra low emission vehicle charging is proposed as is required by policy. Uh, and on that basis, we've had no objections from the local highways authority. Just to make members aware, NRW did raise a query with regards to flooding uh, and the site is identified in zone C1 of the current flood maps and is a less vulnerable use as stated in the current technical advice note 15. But it still requires justification and the submission of a flood consequences assessment. Now, members might be aware that the technical advice note is due to be updated on the 1st of December, uh, but in the interim, the Welsh Government have clarified we need to consider the proposals under the current situation and the current uh, adopted policy guidance. Um, and as I said, we have sought some clarification from the applicant which has been provided. So whilst the site doesn't meet the definition of previously developed land in isolation, it does form part of a wider regeneration area initiative with infrastructure laid out as such uh, and must have been considered as such as part of the allocation process, given that the LDP was adopted after the TAN was formally adopted. The site would remain flood free in the 1% plus climate change event but would flood in the 0.1% event. So to mitigate this, levels would be increased on site by 500 mil, uh, and the flood depths and consequences are therefore considered acceptable, uh, and NRW have raised no objection. So this one is a recommendation for approval, subject to conditions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you again, thank you. Uh, Councillor Black, you've got your hand up there. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, it's it's specific, specifically on, on the flood risk, I think, which. I does concern me. I mean, clearly from the of what the officer said and from reading the report, uh, mitigation measures are being put in place to try to ensure that the the, the development um, is, stays um, relatively flood free. But of course, whenever you put a mitigation measure in place, it has a knock on effect elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And so there is a concern that as you continue to fill up these floodplains, with developments, all of whom put in mitigation measures to cope with a certain le um, level of water, that, that they, it's basically storing up problems elsewhere down the river or further down the river and, and can cause further problems. So, I mean, I'm not going to say we should oppose this, but I do think we need to highlight, and I'm, no doubt we'll have the, in the briefing later on on TAN 15 some further information on that. I think we do need to understand that as we continue to build on the floodplain, even with developments like this, which are not residential, that we are building up problems for the future. Okay, thank you. No other hands that anyone else wish to speak? No? Oh, at all? Sure. Right, thank you. Andrew, did you want to respond? Yeah, I, I will thank you, Chair. Um, it is, as I said, it, it is an interesting and important point raised by Councillor Black, uh, and it is something that does need to be considered as part of the flood consequences assessment. So in this instance, as I said, the, the proposals would increase raising the land levels. Now, what the applicant has said, uh, is that that would have um, a, an impact of an additional 600, uh, 6 mil, sorry, uh, it is in the report, um, impact in terms of flooding elsewhere. So there is a marginal increase elsewhere, but within the depths suggested in those events, it is nominal uh, and expected within the tolerance of the model. Um, so in, in terms of the current FCA, as I've said, uh, NRW haven't objected on that basis. Uh, and there will be changes going forward in terms of ensuring uh, that flood consequences assessment are suitably robust going forward in terms of the new uh, technical advice note 15. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jack. That's appreciated. Well, thank you. If no other members wish to speak, then we <coughs> could um, take a vote on that. 
and the recommendation again is of approval. It's done. Yep. Okay. Councillor Sir Lanson? Four. Peter Black? Four. Phil Downing? Four. Will Evans? Councillor Will Evans? Okay. Mary Jones? Four. Mike Lewis? Four. Richard Lewis? Four, Chairman. Paulette Smith? Four. Des Thomas? Four. Mike White? Four. Paul Lloyd? Four. And Councillor Evans, Will Evans, are you back? No, it's just 10, Chairman, unanimous. Mm. Oh, yeah, sorry, Chair, that's four. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Limit machines playing up today. Yeah, you're not the only one having problems. Um, okay, then. Item three is. Um, I, I'm leaving the meeting for this, Chair. Yeah. We'll okay. we, 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 we leave then. Okay. Thank you. I think, thank you, Chair. Back to me. Um, yes, please, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Ian's going to just do a, a brief presentation on this one. As I said, it, it will be very brief. Um, yeah. As I said, I'll just refer members to the update sheet where in terms of the new SPG is not considered to be anything of any significance that needs to be raised. Um, so we've got the site location plan before you. The application has been reported to planning committee as the applicant is a councillor and a member of planning committee. Um, so the application site comprises of a mid terrace property located on Cecil Street. Uh, I can go to the next the, uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So these are the existing and proposed plans. Uh, you've got the existing plans on the left, uh, with, which basically indicates a flat roof bay window. Now, this proposal, all it is, is for um, uh, a monopitched tile roof above the bay window. Um, so the monopitched roof would measure 75 centimetres in height by 75 centimetres in depth, covering the full extent of the bay window, two and a half metres wide, and would be finished in terracotta tiles. Um, so if we can go to the next one, please, Ian. These are Google images. The application property uh, is the third one in, uh, which currently has a flat roof. Uh, and you'll note uh, the variety of pitch roof beyond uh, in terms of both the uh, pitch uh, of the roof and the materials and how far they, they cover. Uh, the bottom right indicates hipped roofs located directly opposite in a variety of colours, uh, and the bottom left shows the variety of styles of pitch roofs in materials uh, similar to that proposed, albeit that these cover the porch, which doesn't form part of this application. Uh, so no objections have been raised to the proposal from neighbours. Um, it's not considered to be any impact in terms of residential amenity. Uh, and in terms of the limited nature of the works and the variety uh, that already exists in the street scene, no issues are raised in terms of its visual impact on the host dwelling or the character of the area. So the application is recommended for approval, subject to conditions. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Any member wish to speak? No, right. Sure. All right. Well, you see the recommendation is there uh, to approve. And, and again, we take a vote on that. Yep. Councillor Cyril Anderson? Four. Phil Downing? Four. Will Evans? Four. Mary Jones? Four. Mike Lewis? Four. Richard Lewis? Four, Chairman. Cheers. Paulette Smith? Four. There's Thomas? Four. Mike White? Four. And Paul White? Yeah, four. four. That's ten for the chairman. So just. Yeah, that's carried. Thank you. We call the House of Black. Just waiting for Councillor Buck to rejoin. There we are, he's back in. There we go, thank you. Welcome back. And uh, we we'll move on to the next item now, which is item four, uh, page 86, and that's at the Strand. Uh, Liam, uh, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, I'll take the members through this, uh, this one. Yeah. OK, we've got a presentation here. Um, the application proposes a purpose-built student accommodation scheme on land at the Strand. 
So you can see the area highlighted in red there on, on the plan. So the site occupies an area of 0.143 hectares. It's currently vacant. The most recent use strip was um, or well, has been an informal car park. So you see there on the red line, just alongside the more formal car park. Mm. Um, so uh, the bottom end of Green Dragon Lane, you can see the arrow there as it comes up to the corner of the site. So the development would involve the construction of a 312 studio apartment um, student scheme in a building that um, goes up to 12 to 10 storeys in height. So the building itself has um, ancillary communal facilities for students, cycle bin storage, external landscape courtyard area. And then in, inside the building itself, um, got amenity spaces, including things like reception, foyer lounge, social lounge area. Uh, it's got a games and cinema room. There's an 11th floor lounge, and there's even a roof terrace on this uh, scheme. There's um, external courtyard and then uh, cycle storage within the building as well. So uh, in terms of the principal entrance to the building, um, it's on the corner. So, well, if you look at this plan, it'd be the bottom left then on the screen. So you've got the lane that comes um, down Green Dragon Lane on your bottom left, and then it's the, the area on the corner, sort of your, your principal elevation into an access into the building. In terms of the scheme itself, it's designed as being car free. So in line with other purpose built student uh, schemes that we're dealing with, um, it'll provide secure cycle parking within the ground floor. So you can just see that um, the plan's not uh, great in terms of the, you, you can't, can't see the detail on it, but um, it's sort of in the middle there. So yeah, where Ian's highlighting. So you can see all that, that's all internal to the building. And then uh, you can see the pink area. So that's the sort of lounge foyer area um, facing onto the strand. So it's, um, we should show you the elevations now shortly. In terms of principle, um, as really set out in the report, um, policy H11 is the key policy for student schemes. It states that proposals for purpose-built student accommodation should be within the Swansea central area. This site is in, in that area. It's brownfield land. It's um, part of a wider allocation, SDG, in your LDP for a range of regeneration projects. The overall aim of that policy is to create sort of vibrant, distinctive central area, capitalising on uh, says the unique assets to become a destination of regional and national significance. So, in 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 effect, um, there's a concept plan in the LDP that marks this site as being sort of a mixed use development opportunity uh, in a key area here on the Strand. In terms of um, the policy as well, it sets up some placemaking principles. Um, this particular this site is part of the Park Tower Urban Gateway complementary area um, and, and really it, it, it expects that developments will upgrade the built environment, the public realm, um, you know, make a better place essentially in, in this particular zone. In terms of other placemaking principles, um, the adopted uh, Swansea Central Area Regeneration Framework, so the SCARF document, it um, looks at this area, there's some concept plans in there. Um, in effect, it's about creating active frontages as well. So, so where you've got a building being proposed, it's making sure that it meets the street in an appropriate way and creates vibrancy in that area. So, so that, that's really what, what it's looking at doing as, and also creating high quality architecture, um, sense of place really. In terms of um, student schemes, um, they can be taller buildings and um, we have the SPG, the tall buildings SPG that sets up where these buildings should go or shouldn't go. This is actually within the welcome zone. Um, so it's within the in the central areas where where our SPG expects taller buildings to be. So in terms of principles, uh, it, it fits with uh, the policies that we have in our LDP. In terms of design, so if you want to cycle through here into the next next couple of so there you go, there's a good shot there. In terms of design, when the application first came in, uh, came in in March this year, so there were some design concerns raised when it first came in, particularly about the, the, the sort of the blockiness of the building. It had sort of a monolithic uh, form um, and a placemaking team comments and the case officer had gone back and negotiated changes. So those changes, they didn't change the scale. So you can see there, you've got 12 stories um, on the left-hand side and then it steps down to 10 stories. 
that was retained, but what they did do is um, incorporate different material treatments. So you can see there on this main facade, as you look at this, this is from the strand area. So you've got two, two distinctly different color bricks. So you've got the buff there on the left and then the gray on the right. So it gives gives better articulation, breaks down the masses, and then there's some rain screen um, clad in there on the top element. So what it does, it breaks it down and although it's the same sort of scale, it, it, it gives it a better appearance. And as I mentioned earlier about the, the need to provide active frontages, so on the ground floor there you've got that active frontage with the, the glazing meat in the street. So looking at the roof, obviously it's got a stepped approach. So on there you can see sort of rooftop planters on the top right of the image and um, that's where the roof terrace is. And um, it's basically the design is looking at creating a facade pattern that's uh, creating a dynamic skyline. So come on to some images now from um, sort of further afield. So, so these are the other elevations. This is sort of the left hand side then of the building, the north the northwest elevation. So the bottom right is where the access into the building is there. Um, and then you cycle through. Um, so this is the sort of back end of the building, and if you like, the northeast gable end. And then this is the southeast end. So this is the what would be visible then as you're coming down the strand area. So this is an artist's impression um, that's within their supporting documents. So when they talked about the access into the building. You can see it there on the sort of the bottom left of the image. So that's your main access in. So it's the corner. And then you can see a walkway, which is sort of illustrated there. Uh, and then that would basically be what, what, what greets you then on the strand um, and coming down Green Dragon Lane. So if we go through, there's another good image that sort of defines what, what, what it would be. It's a bold, bold architecture. Um, it, it, you've got the existing car park there shown on the right hand side of the image. Um, and then that, that was coming off the strand. So in your report, um, there's been a full consideration of impacts, um, into visual impacts in, in, in effect and heritage impacts. So um, officers have looked at existing listed buildings, the former post office listed building opposite, the Wine Street Conservation Area, Swansea Castle, Inchon Monument, etc. So we've looked at those elements. Uh, I put a few images on here, viewpoints. Um, so you've got the existing image and then I put, sort of uh, pasted below the proposed image. So this is on the approach as you cross the bridge into Swansea. Um, and we park tower on the right hand side, you've got the BT tower there in shot. So effectively it would be set down in profile there alongside uh, the BT tower. So if we go through, there's a few other images I put in. So that's the sort of bottom end of Wine Street, uh, Somerset Place, the crossing area. As so you've got the existing BT Tower in the top, and then it's like as you, as, you, as you view that, then against the backdrop of it. Next image. So this uh, is an image as you as you would be walking down the Strand. Um, so you've got that that side elevation there. And again, this is uh, from further afield than the Sail Bridge as you look it, look into town. So um, you're just getting the impression of the building then uh, sort of dropping down alongside the BT Tower. And that's the view then of the top of Castle Gardens there. So they've illustrated um, you know, views from uh, the setting then of the uh, castle. And then I've just zoomed in there to sort of show that relationship between the two. So that's the same image as we just seen, but um, just zoomed it in for members to show to show that relationship between the, the BT Tower and this proposal. And then that's the same image as earlier. So in terms of um, the scheme, um, you'll see there's reference in the report to green infrastructure. So see a central facet now of your LDP is that this by well, the specific policies on providing um, good open space, good green infrastructure, to, for, which are fundamental to, to good place making. So there's reference in there to the um, green infrastructure strategy 
in the green space factor tool that we will use on schemes. Um, so we consider that um, when making a recommendation and um, consider what green infrastructure can be imposed on, on the scheme. So you'll see um, in the report there's been reference to the roof areas. So whilst there will be a student amenity space on the 11th floor, I believe the, the other areas of that building are proposed as extensive green roofs with um, multifunctional uh, green infrastructure, SUD strategy, etc. So they've shown that um, the proposal meets the, the green space factor score of 0.4 for residential developments. So that's a positive. Um, and then we can secure that through further conditions then, um, which are set out in the report. In terms of highway uh, impacts, um, well, as mentioned, it's, a, it's essentially a car-free development. It's in a sustainable location um, in the city centre. Whilst it's... Um, once, once the site's within the Swansea Central Strategic Development Area is defined in uh, the parking guidelines, it's, it's not located within the city centre core area. So we, we need to balance up the location um, again you know, in terms of how, how good the access is to existing public transport, bus routes, um, you know, and how we can make sure that um, we can shift the balance on private cars coming into to the city. So there's mechanisms as we've done on other student schemes of um, providing um, to, to make sure that the scheme is, is occupied by students only um, and then putting in place um, tenancy agreements and trying to control the existing use of the, um, the existing um, any parking. Obviously, there is no parking pros on this, but making sure that the cycle areas are provided and, and retained. Um, the other impact set out in your report is that of um, potential flooding. So the application was accompanied by a flood consequences assessment. So this followed the guidance on development and flood risk set out in TAN 15. So the existing site has a, a typical ground level of six metres above ordnance data. And um, currently the development advice maps used to trigger different planning actions based on um, sort of the precautionary approach uh, to flood risk. So the site is currently in zone C1, uh, areas of flood base served by significant infrastructure, including flood defence. And that then um, triggers the need for an FCA to demonstrate compliance with um, what is a justification test. So the site um, plays an important part in regeneration of the city centre. And as I mentioned earlier, complying with our strategic policies. So it meets that first test. Second test then is about been on previously developed land, so it needs that test as well. So in terms of the impacts themselves, the greatest risk comes from tidal flooding uh, due to the predicted climate change effect on sea level. Uh, in the 0.5% plus climate change events, so that's a one in 200 year event, the building would remain flood free. However, the FCA acknowledges that in the 0.1% uh, climate change uh, tidal event for so one in a thousand years, the building would experience um, some shallow ground floor flooding of up to 0.25 um, meters. Uh, so due to flood risk considerations, the proposed finished floor level of the development has been set at 7.4 meters above ordnance data. So an external courtyard area and bin store set to match existing ground levels. And then the building is to be raised at a significant height above the existing ground levels so that um, it will avoid the potential to displace flood water, so that void then being formed below the ground floor. Um, so NRW, they provided a detailed consultation response to the FCA. They've expressed some concerns, but they haven't objected to the development. Um, in conclusion, it stated the FCA is considered to give a reasonable assessment of flood risk and proposed development over its lifetime, and that accepts the significant flood risk to the site. So the FCA confirms um, that the application site cannot comply with the flood free threshold required by table A1.14 TAN 15. The building itself will be raised significantly above significant site levels to remain flood free inside. And it further recognises that no residential areas of the building will be flooded. Although, in, as I mentioned, in the extreme event of ground floor could be flooded. Um, up to depths of um, 0.28 metres, the NRW response uh, refers to. 
So on the information before us, um, and based on the current policy position, uh, the scheme is acceptable on its uh, flooding impact. However, as set out in the report, um, members' attention is drawn to the new emerging TAN 15, which has been published by Welsh Government but does not take effect until the 1st of December. But Welsh Government have said that all current schemes being processed shall be processed in line with current policy. And the existing TAN, um, obviously, doesn't come into it. The existing TAN, you know, they should be processed in accordance with, and the new TAN will come into play on the 1st of December. So it'll come into effect then. So the site will be located in flood zone three of the new TAN. Um, and there, you know, there are implications there. Um, if that's if this scheme was considered against the new TAN, but um, in the lead up to the 1st of December, it's been set up with a pragmatic approach is to be taken. Um, there's no objection from NRW on the scheme before us. Um, so we are, we are satisfied that it does comply with the existing policy position. In terms of other issues, um, I won't go through these in, in, in full now, but there's they set up in the report. Um, issues such as archaeology, cultural heritage, noise assessments, ground contamination, ecology. It's found there's no adverse impacts arising from these, these matters and suitable conditions can be imposed as um, I'll set out in your report. So in addition to those conditions, we are recommending a 106 agreement is um, um, agreed um, in, set of, in terms of a set of clauses as we have done on other student schemes. So to include a car parking management plan for things like um, pick up on you know, in terms of day to day management of the site and the drop off arrangement, particularly at the beginning and end of terms to, to make sure that that is managed and then mechanisms to deal with on site parking and the clauses that the occupants shall be registered students only. So um, subject to those uh, mechanisms and conditions, we are we are content the scheme is acceptable and in compliance with our policy position. And um, I'll put it to members then. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, anyway, you know, uh, Mr. Hooper now has been sitting there patiently waiting to uh, address us. And so, like that, Mr. Hooper, you have know, your five minutes to address the committee. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, members. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Gareth Hooper. I'm a director at DPP Planning. We're the agents for the application before you this afternoon. Um, the officer's report to committee sets out a detailed assessment of the proposals, concluding that they represent a significant regeneration of this site and will make a positive contribution to meeting the growing demand for purpose-built student accommodation. I don't wish to add too much to um, the officer's detailed report, which sets out the basis for the recommendation, but do wish to highlight a couple of points um, on specific matters that I believe should be taken into account when you reach a decision on this application this afternoon. Firstly, it's important to note the proposals are consistent with the principles of the development plan, making an important contribution to the regeneration of a centrally located underutilised site. As set out in the committee report, the proposals will make an important contribution towards meeting the growing demand for purpose built student accommodation. As the report highlights, whilst many schemes have been improved in recent years, the student um, student to bed ratio in Swansea remains below the national average at a time when Swansea University is one of the fastest growing institution, institutions in the UK. As such, these proposals will support the continued growth of the university, as well as freeing up houses in multiple occupation back into family housing. In respect to the scale of development and the design of the proposals, we've worked really hard with officers to reach a point where the proposals are considered acceptable and also meet the green infrastructure requirements of the council. The site is located within the welcome zone in which tall buildings are considered to create a positive impact on the city. Equally, the proposals will respond positively to the setting of designated heritage assets and create an active ground floor which will promote vitality and viability along the Strand. The officer's report addresses the issues associated with the flooding and correctly outlines that under the current guidelines, the proposals meet all of the requirements and can be approved today. Crucially, there are no consultee objections to the proposals and there have been no resident objections to the application. In summary, as set out in the officer's report, the proposals represent a significant regeneration of this site and will contribute towards wider regeneration aims of the area. 
The scheme is in a highly sustainable location and will contribute towards supporting the growth of Swansea University, as well as enabling HMOs to return to family housing, helping meet family housing needs. The applicant has worked closely with officers and significant amendments have been made during the course of the application to address initial design concerns about design and massing. And as a result, the proposals are not subject to any objections from consultees or the public. The proposals will result in environmental, social and economic benefits for Swansea. So I hope you feel able to support the officer's recommendation for approval. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so a number of speakers here first. Uh, Councillor Mike Lewis. Thank you, Chair. Uh, hi, Liam. Um, as you've indicated, uh, that the a no car policy has been included in this scheme. Uh, this will obviously create more pedestrian movement. Um, can you reassure the committee that the crossing that is indicated on the strand will be a controlled crossing for the safeguarding of the students? Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Councillor White. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, within the report uh, on highway safety, page under 11 and 12, there's mention of, of, the, of the new footway link and also the new zebra crossing, but there's no mention of any 106 contribution. Um, can we have clarification on that? Because, you know, if, the, if these are going to be implemented, surely this, this cost must, 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 must come, come on down to the developer. Thank mm -hmm. you, Chair. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Councillor Mary Jones. Thank you, Chair. Funnily enough, mine's on the same theme, uh, but I'm more concerned about student uh, safety in the whole area. Uh, for many years, I worked in this area um, and coming out in the strand in the evening in the dark is, you know, it's pretty unpleasant. And I know there's uh, it's opened the corner up and there are uh, flats in the old post office building. But nevertheless, where your entrance is, which is opposite Green Dragon Lane and Green Dragon Lane isn't really uh, highly trafficked. And I know there is um, a report or something to do with Wine Street and about uh, how we're going to upgrade the um, lanes and alleyways leading up to Wine Street. I'm still extremely concerned that this um, student accommodation here is in quite a dark part of the Strand and there's no uh, mention of any increased lighting. Now, um, I think Mr Hooper said something about the um, ground floor would be more uh, active and light than that. But even if you're coming down from, um, I can't remember the road, Care Street, by the old Woolworth Argos building and turning right there, it is still pretty dark because it's the backs of buildings in the night and I'm very concerned about the student safety, but also the I got the same question about the uh, control crossing at the bottom of Green Dragon Lane, because if it's dark, then I think you need a not just a zebra crossing, you need a control crossing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, before I ask my my, uh, my question, Mr. Hooper did say that um, with the students' accommodation then um, HMOs would uh, return to family family occupation. Particularly we couldn't pat, put that in as a condition, isn't it? But every time we allow one of these, we shut down X amount of HMOs. Um, but anyway, on, um, I think it's page 125 on the section 106 obligation, can the officer explain why it says that um, if this 106 isn't signed within um, 27, 28 days, then, then you could exercise discretion to look at the new TAM 15. But up to now, if we're looking at application today, we're looking at the old TAM 15. So we introduce it after, say, like I said, 28, 29 days. Okay. Yeah. So finally, Councillor Thomas. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'm looking at things far more fundamental. I think um, the design of the building for a start um, leaves a lot to be desired in my my way of thinking. It's purely block design, isn't it? It looks like um, something that's come out of a Lego kit. It's um, 
but I'm not surprised. I mean, we've um, we we opposed the other student building just across the other side of the river, and of course that was allowed on 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 appeal, and that again looked like the old Weavers building, which was um, which was blocks. It leaves um, leaves a lot to be desired um, design wise, I think. Um, the other thing, um, the floodplain. This is very close to the low point. Um, if and when flooding takes place in the floodplain, which covers a lot of the of the city centre, um, is going to be vulnerable. The low point is near the Sainsbury's um, riverside. There, uh, that that is going to need. Um, uh, increasing in in flood, flood protection. Um, I don't suppose there's any question of uh, this being um, included in any one or six agreements um, for any new development within the um, within the floodplain as it is. I mean, obviously, um, it's going to be a costly exercise upgrading the the riverbanks, and um, uh, I just like the thoughts on that from the officers. Perhaps I'm being unrealistic to expect individual um, applicants to um, to contribute to that. But you know, it is something that's going to have to be um, approached in in the future, uh, and perhaps not in the the too distant future. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you. We've got no other hands up. Um, Liam, did you want to come back on? Uh, yes, um, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, going through the report, um, you know, a number of comments there about um, recommendation in terms of the 106 and uh, matters on the highway. So we've imposed condition 11, so I draw your attention to page 126. Um, so I believe that would wrap up the concerns that you're, you're talking about in terms of the public realm improvement works. So essentially that condition requires a scheme uh, prior to the installation of the public realm improvement works a scheme should be submitted to an approved in writing by the local planning authority setting up the public realm improvements of the footways adjacent to the site frontage so then it talks about the scheme incorporating a three meter shared use footway cycleway um, and the creation of a zebra crossing on the strand and to the west of the site yeah. in, into green dragon lane and then it does refer in there to include um, surfacing, curb edging, drainage and lighting specifically, um, light um, signing and street furniture. So, so there is a condition there. Um, I don't know if my highway, highway colleague can come um, you know, on further with that, but essentially it is outside the development site, but there is control there to ensure um, that, you know, given the addition, additional number of uh, people that would be living in that area, that uh, improvements would be made to the, the surrounding infrastructure. Um, comments um, about um, why we put reference in the report to um, potentially refusing the application if it wasn't signed by the 1st of December. The reason for that um, is purely down to the, the, the change in the technical advice note. Uh, so TAN 15 comes into effect on the 1st of December. Um, and effectively that changes the, the landscape in terms of the, the flooding um, situation. And if this application was determined after that date, um, we need to be looking at the new TAN. So we have to have regard to that. Um, if, if we don't um, approve this, this development by that date, um, and if the 106 is not completed, then there are grounds to refuse the application. So it is set out in your report. Um, I'll just find the page now. Um, page 118, it, it sets it out there in a few paragraphs. Um, I mean, essentially, the guidance that we have been given is that we need to be pragmatic up until that date to consider schemes on their merits based on the current technical advice note. Uh, so, so that effectively is where our recommendation is based on, is based upon. Um, and then. Obviously, Councillor Thomas, you know, you, you've raised design concerns. I mean, we have you know, negotiated uh, changes to the design since it first came in, and, and we were, you know, we have, um, um, you know, you're accepting that you know, there are elements of concern there. We've 
we've sort of come to a, a scheme that we feel comfortable with from a, a planning and placemaking perspective and feel the design um, would add value to that area. It must have been uh, pretty bad originally, William. Well, I mean, you know, we, officers have worked hard and there's been changes. I mean, we have to accept that um, the way something looks it, it is not always a good place. Good placemaking is the you know how it fits in with the, the strategy overall and how that building will, will make a place. So, I mean, the, the strand is in need of regeneration and I think this building would add value to that area. Um, it's an element of taste, isn't it? But um, I mean, in terms of the building itself, it, it is broken up and articulated. We, we feel well, and it, um, a, a placemaking officer has um, you know, given, given comments that they're in the report there. Um, so, so we feel comfortable with it from a, a planning perspective. In terms of the, the flooding impact, I mean, as, as we set out in the report, I mean, we have to you know, have regard to the current TAN. Um, we would normally um, enter into a 106 to provide um, off-site improvements in this particular instance. Um, but um, that, you know, that, would, that would be for members to make that decision. If, if you felt it was necessary, then we'd have to look at it. But um, obviously the, the scheme before us has to be considered on the merits um, of the, um, and the merits of it and the current the current framework which is in your report and, and that is one of approval thank you chair yeah um, uh, thanks for the, your explanation there William. I've got two hands up the three now um, uh, Matthew did you want to come in first there no you might be on mute you're on mute now it's um, arguably a very sustainable location. The uh, developer has offered up uh, various public realm enhancements and improvements to the existing footways to shared use to link it to the NCN, which links both campuses. Um, the councillor White raised the issue of costs of that. Obviously, it's been offered up as part of the application, would be undertaken under a 278 agreement with the Highway Authority with all the costs to be borne by the developer. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think. Given the nature of the strand, the levels of vehicle usage, I think a zebra crossing is appropriate there because it affords pedestrians absolute priority crossing the road. Um, similar to what the work that's gone on the Kingsway recently, in, in conjunction with other public realm enhancements, um, it certainly provides a better pedestrian environment and doesn't encourage vehicles to, to travel too quickly. Um, Councillor Jones raised the lighting. Obviously, lighting would have to be considered as part of any design into new public areas, new crossings specifically, because crossings have certain lighting requirements. Uh, and as part of the detailed design of the crossing, the lighting in the area would be considered and upgraded if necessary. OK, thank you. Right, I've got a few hands up again now. Councillor White. Yes, thank you, Chair. Yes, I just know I just wanted clarification really because normally within the applications like this for uh, highways works and uh, 106s, there's always a sum included so we know exactly what we're asking the the the, the actual developer for. But yeah, there's there's no sort of a fi fi figure mentioned. Okay, yeah, the yeah. developer is required to provide the works, whatever the cost of those works is. Yeah, it does get the mention there. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Anderson. Yeah, just a quick one, Chair. Um, under tall buildings, uh, can we be assured that uh, fire risks and all that, uh, you know, proper implementation of uh, firefighting facilities are there? Mm. Yeah, okay, get that answered now. Cheers. And my last time, oh, sorry. Councillor Richard Lewis and Mike Lewis. Well, Chairman. <coughs> I think the uh, the main quality of the bill, I think the quality of the bill is fine. I think that what you've got to remember is it's a wonderful location for students coming to Swansea. And that's what you've got to look at. And mm -hmm. I don't see, you know, it, th to get the numbers of 300 there, you have to have a tall, large building. And I think that the students deserve decent accommodation, well, well looked after, as we are finding more and more people and the students are going for this type of accommodation. And if we are to attract more students to Swansea University, we've got to have the facility 
to make sure this type of accommodation is there. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, the building looks great. I don't see any problem with that. There are enough ugly buildings elsewhere in Swansea not to worry about. And as far as I'm concerned, I will support this application, Chairman. Indeed, thank you. And um, last speaker is Councillor Lewis. Thank you, Chair. Uh, firstly, I've got to say I'm uh, not happy at all with the, the the provision of a zebra crossing. I, I still think, uh, you know, the, the safety should be a priority in, uh, for students, especially coming from other parts of the, the country to, and, and not knowing Swansea. Um, only last uh, couple of months we passed a uh, an application for a, a housing development um, and we, we we insisted that it had a, a control crossing across a, a roads which had less traffic that, than the strand has so uh, I I don't know which way I'm going to vote on this because I, I do feel that it should be included in the scheme um, safety is a priority and we should as councillors we are all charged with safeguarding and I do feel it's just as a simple Z crossing is no good in this case. Thank you. OK, thank you. There was one query there on the fire safety, wasn't there? Which... Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, fire safety that does get brought up on, on these schemes quite a bit. I mean, it, it is essentially a building controls map, building control matter. Uh, for approval under the bill control process. I mean, we control the, the planning side of things and, and the look and the, you know, the, the impacts arising from the look and the, the material itself. So we do put conditions on, um, and uh, we put conditions on this particular scheme to the samples as we would on other schemes. So it's not something that um, we are to look at in this particular application, but it would be covered under separate legislation. Yeah, uh, only because it wasn't. Uh anything in the in the agenda item it that's the only reason why i asked yeah thank you Very comment okay thank you right now, no other hands up then and um you can see the you know you see the recommendation there is of approval so we now take that vote <clears throat> yep councillor Sarah anderson four peter black four phil downing or will evans Four. Mary Jones. Four. Mike Lewis. Yes, four. Richard Lewis. Definitely yes, Chairman. Yes. Paulette Smith. Four. There's Thomas. Against. Mike White. Four. And Paulette. And four. That's ten, four, one against. Yeah, well, that's carried again. Thank you. And then um, the final item on our agenda is item five, and that uh, is at Trawler Road. You'll find that on page 131. That's Liam again, yeah? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I'll cover this one as well. Yeah. So essentially, this application is a section 73 application proposing the variation of condition one of Planning Commission 2016-1333 to extend the time period in which to commence the development by a further five years. So the site itself is off Trawler Road, um, it's known previously as Site J, which is um, the remaining vacant site making up the Swansea Point development. So it, this particular site has been to committee previously. Um, I brought it in December 2016 at which time we discussed the application, the history of the site, and there was a former hotel approval on the site. Um, and then we can compare the new student scheme, the footprint to the, that previous consent. So the main issue at the time was the principle of development in terms of whether we felt it was suitable for student accommodation or not. The site was um, considered under policy HC11 of the UDP, and then we consider this design um, the building wasn't too dissimilar in scale um, and footprint really from the, the consent for the hotel. We, we resolved and we approved the application subject to 106 agreement. So 106 agreement was signed and the commission issued in April 2017. So effectively there's an extant consent um, for 
the development to, to take place and the developer could carry that uh, make a material start any time up until April 2022 so April next year so they, that's when their five years comes up so essentially this application is proposing uh, the renewal of that condition to allow them to a bit more time essentially to start the development so we just cycle through the slides um, and just just show really what we approved previously so the building approved ranges from four to six stories in height um, incorporated in 287 student bedrooms and ancillary community facilities as well as um, there's three commercial units on the ground floor and there's some undercroft car parking and servicing areas we just cycle through this just to give members the flavor of what we approved um, in 2016 well 2017 after the one six was signed but um, you can see the, the feel to the building and the design of it there and then we cycle through the shot and again we've got the um, next next slide then will show the floor area of it um, so I think I remember showing members the the dotted blue line was the hotel approval and, and this was sort of within the realms of uh, what was approved previously. So essentially in this new application what we have to consider is whether there's been any significant changes in policy terms that mean we would now take any different view to the scheme on its planning merits. Um, so essentially it would result in a new planning permission um, albeit we have to have in mind the fact that we've already got this extant scheme in place that could be developed on site. So in your report, um, you talked about um, site remaining to be an appropriate area for redevelopment and uh, it calls with H11 on um, student proposals needing to be within the central area. The key policy changes that have emerged since we last approved this scheme it mainly relates to things like green infrastructure requirements. So there's obviously a thrust of uh, policy now to um, provide enhancement to city centre sites, um, as well as the introduction of the SUDS requirements. So, so when this kit first came in, there were some potential concerns about um, the lack of green infrastructure. Um, the applicant submitted an amenity statement and green infrastructure strategy. So we just go on to the next couple of slides, Ian. Um, um, I think it's the next one then. Oh, that's just the elevation treatment. Um, yes, yeah, this this is this this the the new drawing and they've submitted with this application. So it's essentially showing how um, they would meet the SUDS requirements there, um, having the additional planting areas using existing space within the site. Although it is constrained, um, it includes rain gardens and um, SUDS features. So they've assessed the scheme using the green space factor tool um, comes up to 0.12 currently so that's below the 0.4 target that we'd um, normally be looking for now um, in city centre sites but what they've said in order to reach that 0.4 target that they can use green roofs on the building so we feel that's an acceptable approach um, and um, it could be secured through a planning condition so we feel that um, it would embrace the new policy aspirations. Um, and once accepting it, essentially is retrofitting it to a scheme that's already been approved. And then there's additional measures like ecological enhancements um, can be added um, as part of the condition process. Another material consideration uh, set out in the report is that of flood risk. So um, when the scheme came in, it was subject to a flood consequences assessment. I consider the potential depth of flooding being within the TAN tolerances and then I have been consulted on this new scheme and they've confirmed no objection based on the current TAN. TAN. So officers have no objection to further extending the time to develop this scheme by five years. We feel it uh, remains acceptable on planning grounds. Um, conditions will be reimposed when necessary so they're in your report and then new ones added to reflect that green infrastructure uh, issue which I just talked about. So, so furthermore, a new 106 agreement would have to be entered into as well um, and, and updating on the, the measures there that, uh, that we've imposed on student schemes. So thank you, Chair. Um, that's the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, no, no member wish to speak? No? Sure. Okay. So we can see the um, 
recommendation there is the one of approval to extend the. Uh, Sorry, okay, I did. I was trying to put my hand up. Sorry, it, came up it came up eventually, but I did have about eight scores in it. Um, okay, Chair. Carry on, yeah. Right. It's the same again about the 106. So, have I got this right? Um, if the developer starts work tomorrow, everything in front of us is thrown out? Yes, no? Yeah, so that, uh, yeah. Yeah. Do you want me to come back on that point? Yes, yeah. So, yeah. so yes, there's an extant planning permission in place with subject to a 106. The developer could carry that out now. Yeah, with the 106, he's got in place at this moment in time. Correct, yes. If he wants, if he wants the five extra years, he's got to sign the new 106 agreement before the 1st of December. Correct, yes. Yeah. All right, yeah. Thank you. I'll take your hand down then. I don't think it's working properly. <laughs> no one else wishes to speak. You see the uh, recommend. No? You see the recommendation is one of approval. Uh, I would take that vote now then. <clears throat> Councillor is right. Senator Anderson? Oh. Peter Black? Four. Thank you. Phil Downing? Oh. Will Evans? Paul. Mary Jones. Paul. Mike Lewis. Paul. Richard Lewis. Gone. No. Not present. Okay. Paulette Smith. Four. There's Thomas. Four. Mike White. Four. And Paul Lloyd. Yeah, four. Just ten for yeah. Chairman. Is Harry. Unanimous. Yep. Castle Lewis gone. Yeah, he's sure. left it. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you, folks. And now we need to um, we need to sign up and sign back in there for the uh, time.